by my old boat. I'm gonna sail if she'll float, cause I got the deep river blue. Let it rise, let it fall, let the waves make a wall, cause I got the deep river blue. Peel Island is a small, possibly malignant tumour growing 7 kilometres off the coast of Brisbane. Its symptoms often include boredom and leprosy. I came here looking for a cure. Cradle gently in the bosom of the boat with the essentials I figured I might need on Peel. Some beer, a dog with a questionable personality and a sunny attitude that was forecast to last all day. While the tranquil beauty of Horseshoe Bay may catch your eye immediately, the welcome party of eager, hungry mosquitoes heaves you back from the mirage of a tropical island paradise and catapults you into the vexatious quagmire of reality on a Morton Bay island. This is the place of your dreams, if your dream is of a swampy island filled with mosquitoes. It was high time for a post-arrival beer, because I figured if I stayed drunk, I wouldn't notice the mosquitoes as much. A bit of the old slip slop and slap and I was off for a wander to suss out the dirty entrails of Peel Island. I brought with me a sense of adventure, a bottle of water and three important questions. One, why is it so hot? Two, should I have brought more beer? Three, I hope leprosy isn't contagious. The loud buzz of flying insects coming from behind the trees didn't deter me. I pushed on in search of the truth. Today the island is mostly used as a breeding ground for horseflies, but it has had a few different uses in the past. Between 1907 and 1959, this island operated as a leper colony, as government policy at the time dictated that if you dump shit that you don't want on a remote island, the problem goes away forever and everything will be fine. Patients would come here by boat to be held indefinitely, isolated from society by a 7 km strait of misery and despair. After a woman named Phyllis Ebbage contracted the disease, she was held on the island for 12 years and 8 months. Phyllis was subjected to a great deal of experiments involving novel drugs, and was held for years even after she began testing negative for leprosy. She described the island as terrible, dreadful and primitive. Her words, not mine. Conditions were harsh throughout its existence, and boredom was such an issue that the patients had apparently become known on the mainland for their rampant alcoholism. Years later, after its closure, scientists were determined that the strain of leprosy these people had wasn't even contagious. Just like me, they suffered unnecessarily at the hands of their mosquito overlords. The weather was starting to look a bit grim. I thought I'd better hightail it back to the campsite before it started raining bloody meat pies and kangaroos. And now, a poem. And so as the clouds became dark with anger, and the windeth didst bloweth with ferocity, and bestowed upon me the depressed shuffle of a leper, as I did drag mine own feet back into the camp. And as I wandered and pondered, and the clouds hath continued to leer, if to be true this island was to ship, there'd be no one on board to steer. I set up a makeshift lean-to using the cover for my boat. I may have been furious at the Bureau of Meteorology, but at least the mosquitoes are gone now. The rain seemed to have kept them at bay, at least for a little while. Just like Travis, it always seemed to be raining on me. I was the ant, and God was the storm trying to flood my burrow. Avalon seemed to be furious that I would so recklessly endanger her welfare by bringing her to an abandoned island in the middle of a light shower. After the clouds buggered off, the mercury started to climb. It almost seemed as though the island had ceased to try to give me AIDS and instead decided to try to drown me in moist, soupy air. Nevertheless, I had a secret weapon at my behest that would prove quite mighty in the fight to address this sweaty mess. The most tried, tested and guaranteed effective alternative medicine in the world. Beer. I tried to give Avalon some water, but she rejected me, so I turned my attention to the dogs in the ocean. I decided to get the jig up the thing and whack out a flibber line. Time to bust up a flatty hull. You're gone in the morning, home in the evening. I feel you breathing so much harder than before.
I wandered out toward the shoreline, but I didn't realize how fucking far away the shoreline actually was, and the rocks were starting to hurt my feet. I turned around to find a better path. The crabs scuttled frenetically, unperturbed by the hole in the ozone layer that seemed to be focused directly above my head. Maybe the crab's shells weren't only good protection from mosquitoes, but also served as a hat for their whole bodies, I pondered. It was time to throw in a line. Avalon watched on in silence, judging me as usual. I didn't care that she didn't think of me as a good fisherman. She doesn't even have any bloody thumbs. I found out quickly that getting your line stuck on a rock makes it very difficult to fish. I wandered into the foot deep water, got the lure out of the rock, and decided to throw down all my chips and cast again from whence I stood. For fuck's sake, snagged again. I shouldn't have bothered to fish here, but impatience got the better of me. And so just like Dad taught me, I punctuated my failure with the only thing that would help, an ice cold, no brand beer. Yum. And then it got too hot, so I went back to camp. As soon as we returned, Avalon promptly set about trying to bury the boat, ostensibly as a means to punish me for being a shit fisherman. I ignored Avalon's futile attempt at sabotage. I sat back, and as the hours passed and the sun dipped low, I realized that the less visible the island was, the more pleasant it became. Avalon and I played her favorite game, fetch the stick, but it's my stick, and you can fuck right off if you think you're getting it back. I had a crack at fishing one more time. This time, I caught some seaweed. Since I didn't catch any fish or rice, it looked like sushi seasoned with a dash of disappointment was all that was going to be on the menu that night. The sound of cicadas and mosquitoes filled the air as the passing ferries became fewer and fewer. The boats in the harbour bobbed gently back and forth as I ate my fishless dinner. As soon as the sun set, I went to bed because I had nothing better to do. As I listened to the waves caress Peel's moist shoreline, I fell into a deep sleep. <coughs> a dog, we'll call him Gary, was wandering home one day with a steak in his mouth. As he crossed a bridge over a creek, Gary looked down into the water and noticed another dog. Shit! Well, that dog looks like me, Gary mused. I absolutely must have his steak as well. Two steaks are always better than one. And so with one fell swoop, he lunged for the other dog's steak. But to Gary's horror, his own steak dropped into the water. Gary sat solemnly on the bridge and wept. His only steak lost forever. As Avalon barbed me with one more act of spite, I reflected on my short time on the island. In summary, it's an unpleasant swamp with the dubious history of forced internment. It's filled with mosquitoes, there's a long drop that I forgot to visit, and I thought I heard Ralph Harris's wobbleboard echoing quietly in the distance as I slept. Despite my legitimate and well-founded fear that my dog was going to try to drown me, I still felt it was time to leave. Historically, Peel Island seems to have been a trading place for human suffering, and apparently that hasn't changed very much. And then I thought of the dog and his reflection. Here, I was Gary, and my home was my steak. I thought Peel Island would beat my meat for a night, but I was left longing for more. With retrospect, it would appear that the only cure for this tumour was getting the hell away from it. If you're looking to go somewhere disease-free after your COVID lockdown, I have five words for you. Don't go to Peel Island.